Tonight, the U.S. agrees to send highly controversial, exceptionally dangerous weapons to Ukraine. We will not leave Ukraine defenseless. Cluster bombs banned by more than 100 countries, including Canada. There's got to be other ways to push back the Russians. A brazen daylight shooting on a busy Toronto street. It was really upsetting. And the woman killed may have been a bystander. The Montreal man helping rebuild the Notre Dame Cathedral. For me, it's not a job. His centuries-old technique with a modern twist. This is The National. I'm Renee Filipponi. Ian is away. There is growing criticism tonight of a U.S. decision to send a stockpile of controversial weapons to Ukraine. Weapons so dangerous for civilians, many of America's closest allies won't use them. Cluster munitions are bombs that scatter small explosives across a large area. More than 100 countries have banned them in an effort largely spearheaded by Canada. Still, Washington is defending its decision, saying it was difficult but necessary to help Ukraine's counteroffensive. But as Paul Hunter explains, they may also pose a risk to its citizens, especially children, for years to come. Violently effective, they are extremely lethal. Cluster bombs, seen here in U.S. Defense Department video. Keep your eye on what falls from that plane. The dark speck plummeting toward the ground. Watch carefully because in midair it explodes. Seen here in slow motion, releasing a crowd of smaller but still deadly munitions known as bomblets, which, now back to regular speed video, in turn spread out and can blast a target the size of a football field. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the U.S. will now give Ukraine thousands of them. We will not leave Ukraine defenseless at any point in this conflict, period. But they are hugely controversial, banned by more than 100 countries, including Canada, because of the threat they pose to civilians. Not least from unexploded ordnance, abandoned in the ground, sometimes for years. What happens, these bombs drop little bomblets. Some of them are mistaken as toys, picked up by children with devastating consequences. So. Um, there's got to be other ways to push back the Russians. It doesn't make it an easy decision. And I'm not going to In defending the move, the U.S. underlined Russia's been firing its own cluster bombs at Ukraine throughout the war, and giant swaths of land will need to be demined regardless whether Ukraine now does likewise. As well, the U.S. bombs are said to pose less of a long-term risk. Still, the U.S. acknowledges that risk remains. But there is also a massive risk of civilian harm if Russian troops and tanks roll over Ukrainian positions and take more Ukrainian territory and subjugate more Ukrainian civilians because Ukraine does not have enough artillery. That is intolerable to us. Indeed, as Joe Biden puts it, Ukraine simply needs firepower. We've run out of ammunition. Paul, we know Canada has banned cluster bombs, so what are we hearing from Ottawa about this today? Yeah, well, it's a complicated dance, isn't it? Canada obviously strongly supports Ukraine, and there's no closer ally to the U.S. than Canada. But as well, Canada has long seen itself as a global leader in the pushback against these kinds of munitions. In a statement made after the U.S. announcement, Canada underscored its opposition to cluster bombs broadly, but made no mention of the action now taken by the U.S. Rene. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Security concerns are growing in countries bordering Russia's ally, Belarus. Lithuania is requesting more NATO troops. But, as Briar Stewart shows us, that has some people living near the border feeling uneasy. This dirt road lines part of the nearly 700-kilometer border between Lithuania and Belarus. And a border guard team escorts us through a remote area that they patrol daily. The razor wire fencing is to deter migrants from illegally crossing over. But that's not the only security issue along this part of NATO's eastern flank. Uh, now uh, the border looks very calm and, and safe. However, uh, the situation usually is very dynamic. It might change in the course of uh, a couple of hours. 
Belarus has said it started to receive some of Russia's nuclear weapons, and there's uncertainty around the Wagner fighters and their leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin. After an apparent deal to end last month's rebellion, they were supposed to go to Belarus. The government offered them this camp, but officials say the fighters haven't turned up. If they do, Belarus's president says they will be a valuable asset. Should we need to use this unit to defend our state, if they're here, it will be done in a moment, he says. And that's one of the reasons why Lithuania is appealing for more NATO support. There are already around 1,000 NATO troops stationed in Lithuania, and the country wants to see more. Germany says it's prepared to deploy an additional 4,000 soldiers, but not everybody living near the border thinks that's a good idea. Where's the border? Border, right, this. Yaroslav Levko says he worries that Belarus and Russia might view more NATO troops as an escalation. His neighbor down the block says it will certainly make her uncomfortable. It's going to be hard to sleep soundly at night because there will be more tension. In Vilnius, which is getting ready to host world leaders for the NATO summit, many are in favor of the help. People will feel much safer if we notice that we have them here. Uh, I think we need them, yeah. For now, along the border, residents say life is peaceful, and they just hope it stays that way. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vilnius. Tonight, two women and three teenage girls are back in Canada after being held in Syrian camps. The two women have been arrested in Montreal and uh, taken into custody, and that they, along with the three children, are being uh, transferred to Edmonton. The five Canadians were being held in camps for ISIS suspects and their family members. In April, they were supposed to board a plane repatriating 19 Canadians in those camps back to Canada, but missed it because they were being detained by guards. In Toronto, investigators are trying to piece together what led to a woman being shot and killed in broad daylight. Right now, the gunman is still at large. Police say the victim may have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Lorenda Redekop tells us how this chaotic scene played out. Panic for people in Toronto's East End over the lunch hour when gunshots erupted. Some hit the ground. Saw a man pull out a handgun and shoot a woman in a uh, pink dress. Shot her about two, three times. She tried to flee across the street and she fell on the ground and it looks like he and a group of other gentlemen ran away. Police say three men were in a verbal and physical altercation. Then shots were fired. Police say they don't know how many people had a gun. All three suspects took off on foot. Police say it's believed the victim was likely a bystander. It is unknown at this time if there is a relationship between the female and these three individuals. It is not believed that there is, but this is still actively being investigated. People in the area immediately rushed to help the woman and performed CPR. People were helping her outside. They rolled her over on her side and then saw some wounds on her side. It was really upsetting. She was taken to hospital in life-threatening condition and later died. Police say they've received many videos from businesses in the area, but they're looking for more evidence. We are making an appeal to the public. As you know, this is, was a Friday afternoon on Queen Street East, a very busy neighborhood, commuters, pedestrians, streetcars and vehicles. This is a neighborhood with many families and young children. And just around the corner from here, right after the shooting happened, at a child care centre, they were all told to stay inside. This is a daylight shooting that's left so many people in this neighbourhood shaken. Lorenda Radicomp, CBC News, Toronto. That shooting on the heels of another violent attack causing concern in Toronto. Police are still looking for a suspect who stabbed another man on a busy subway. That incident also in the middle of the day. Katie Nicholson now on what's being done to keep people safe and whether riders think it's enough. A day after a stabbing attack on a subway was caught on video, fear lingers. It's terrifying to, to kind of see, I mean, not only for everyone around, but just for the people involved. I mean, I'm just, um, my heart definitely goes out to the, you know, the victim. Juliana Misasi takes transit every day. Now she's extra cautious. It just reminds you that you always have to keep your eyes open and that you can't um, just, 
yeah, it can't kind of disappear into headphones. The video shows passengers in a chaotic scramble desperately trying to get away after an argument turned physical and a man was stabbed. Police say it's not clear if they knew one another before they stepped on the train. Still, the Toronto Transit Commission says the emergency response was everything it should have been. A number of people hit the emergency alarm yesterday uh, and notified us, and the system worked as it should have. The train stopped and held at the next station. Emergency service responders were on scene very quickly, um, and, you know, that's exactly as the system should work. After a sharp rise in high-profile violent attacks over the last year, the TTC is hiring 50 special constables. It's already brought in security guards. Police regularly patrol transit stations. Reported incidents had plunged dramatically since January, down 33% by May. And then this video. He's stepping up. Invoking the worst fears of some. Every moment I scare, like, oh, something is going to happen right now. Honestly, I don't really feel safe, not really. This latest attack made headlines in New York and London, just as Toronto hits peak tourist season. I'm from New York. I go in the city a lot. The subway is also just really chaotic. Her advice to rattle Torontonians? Travel with a buddy and... I kind of always have that in the back of my head, that like, to like check like my exits and you know how to like get out. So, Katie, a lot of people are worried, but there is one big change coming to Toronto's subway system that could put some minds at ease. Yeah, one of the things the New Yorker told us she likes to do is share her location using an app. I had to explain to her that in the Toronto subways, there's no cell service, but that could be about to change. Rogers is upgrading the 5G service up and down the subway, uh, but it's not clear yet what that's going to mean for Rogers customers come the fall when this is done or for rival telecoms customers. But one thing we've repeatedly heard from commuters is that they would feel more safe if they would be able to make phone calls when they're down there and also share their location. Renee? Thanks, Katie. A landfill in Winnipeg that's been the center of protest is now closed. Protesters are blocking the entrance to the Brady Road landfill after the province said it would not search for the remains of two First Nations women at another landfill north of the city. Provincial officials say the proposed search wasn't safe for workers. The city says it has contingency plans in place for garbage and recycling pickup. Now to a major class action settlement in Alberta. Any woman employed by the city of Leduc in the past 20 years who were sexually assaulted or harassed on the job are now eligible for thousands of dollars. Madeline Cummings tells us how we got here. This is a huge win for women in Alberta and, and across Canada. A class action settlement approved in an Edmonton court this week could have implications across the country. Women who worked for the city of Leduc's fire department sued their employer last year, alleging systemic discrimination and harassment. There haven't been a lot of settlements for this type of workplace with sexual misconduct in Canada, but from what we can tell, this is the highest per person settlement uh, ever in Canada for uh, sexual harassment, and sexual assault in a workplace. The situation has played out publicly, with one firefighter tendering her resignation on the floor of a city council meeting. When I received this badge. I was full of pride. Now when I look at it, all it is is a symbol of my trauma and an unsafe workplace. Though this case began with firefighters, any woman who worked for the city over the past 20 years can join the class action. Each participant could receive between $10,000 and $285,000 in compensation. The agreement also includes a public apology from the mayor and a review of the city's equity strategy. This expert says this outcome could influence future cases. One hopes that there aren't a lot of similar situations at fire departments across the country or other law enforcement agencies. Uh, but if it is the first one involving a municipality as opposed to a federal agency, then it may, it may cause uh, other people in other municipalities to, um, to follow suit. So this might empower women to start coming forward and might empower them to be a little more brave, right? Women have about a year to join the class action and the process will be confidential. The city of Leduc says the settlement is a step towards accountability and healing. It says it's committed to learning from the past to prevent sexual misconduct from happening in the future.
Madeline Cummings, CBC News, Edmonton. New job numbers tonight from Statistics Canada show the Canadian economy is outpacing expectations yet again. Altogether, 60,000 new positions were filled in the month of June, and most of them were full-time. However, despite the added jobs, Canada's unemployment rate actually increased from 5.2 to 5.4 percent. Peter Armstrong joins us now to break down these numbers. So, Peter, what do they tell you? Well, look, they tell me that the economy is still rife with contradictions. You know, in a lot of ways, this jobs report is kind of like one of those Rorschach tests where you can see whatever you're looking for. You know, if you're looking for evidence that the economy is running too hot, it's there. We added, what, 60,000 jobs. Wages are up. People are working more hours. If you're looking for signs that the economy is weak, you can find that too. The unemployment rate actually ticked up as we added more than a million people to Canada's population last year, so you got more people looking for work. And sure, Rene, wages are rising, but they were at 5.4% year over year. Now they're at 3.9%. The hard part, as always, is making sense of these contradictions, especially if you're, say, the Bank of Canada. And now the big question for many, how might this affect next week's interest rate announcement? Look, most economists believe the Bank of Canada will raise interest rates another quarter point. Remember, the bank has been raising these interest rates in an attempt to slow down the economy. As rates rise, consumers tend to buy less stuff. And as we buy less stuff, some of the heat comes out of the economy and price growth should moderate further. But look, the landscape shows inflation's come down from 8.1% to 3.4% in May. GDP is flat. Job growth is only OK. And yet here we are still talking about raising rates, all in an effort to get back to that 2% inflation target. All right. Thanks, Peter. You bet. A very expensive piece of machinery is trapped beneath a Toronto street, and the estimated cost to get it out has now nearly tripled to a whopping $25 million. I think every taxpayer in this city should be furious about the amount of money being spent on this project. The heavy-duty earth-boring machine is worth just $3 million. It was deployed 18 months ago to carve out a storm sewer, but it got caught in some pieces of steel that were part of the construction of a condo building. The estimate to fix this mess has gone from $9 million to $25 million. In B.C., there are growing fears about the potential impact of a province-wide port strike as it nears the one-week mark. Negotiations are stalled and goods at Canada's busiest port are piling up. Bell Puri shows us the impact. BC ports are Canada's gateway to Asia. Right now, nothing is moving. That's a big pile of exports that are coming in by rail that uh, aren't able to get out into containers and be returned to the port. And then over here on my right, we've got some import uh, goods that are left from the shipments that have just finished coming in. Companies that manage the movement of goods are stressed. For every day the port operations uh, are down, it takes us about a week to recover afterwards. 7,400 longshore workers at 30 ports went on strike on Canada Day. It's feared a long dispute could have a devastating impact on the country's supply chain. The uh, Port of Vancouver is what I call Canada's 800-pound gorilla in terms of ports. It handles about 43% of the total port volume in Canada. The BC Maritime Employers Association says already the strike has disrupted $4.6 billion worth of cargo. The workers want higher wages as well as provisions against contracting out and job automation. But since Monday, talks have stalled. Business groups want the federal government to intervene with back-to-work legislation. We believe fundamentally that the best deals are always found at the bargaining table and we will keep putting a, a lot of pressure on all parties uh, to find that solution. Ottawa does have other options. They could legislate a cooling off period, they could mandate a period of uh, mediation, voluntary mediation. We bring in things uh, by less than container load, so we're sharing our containers with uh, a number of other manufacturers. Meanwhile, the strike's effects continue to escalate. Once we get past that 30-day cycle of an ocean container from Asia to North America, that's when we start getting into the scary cost mode for small and mid-sized manufacturers. 30 days, wheels come off the wagon. For these businesses, the longer the strike goes on, the more serious the impact. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. There's a burning problem facing BC's wine industry. If your vineyard is in a valley and you've got forest fires that burn for days, that's when you're going to get the problem. Next, how smoky grapes are ruining prized reds and why consumers might be paying the price. Plus, 
The Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is rising from the ashes. I find a certain spirituality doing this. So for me, it's not a job. Coming up, how Canadians are helping with the massive restoration and Hollywood's big push to get movie lovers back into theaters this summer. We're back in two. That's Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen leading the Calgary Stampede, which kicked off today and will run for the next week and a half. About 300,000 people turned out to see the opening parade. During his visit to the Calgary Stampede, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau sat down with recently re-elected Premier of Alberta, Danielle Smith. I can say there's been a really uh, positive and constructive working relationship uh, between our ministers and our folks uh, from the very beginning. The two discussed their hopes for future talks, including the timeline for reducing emissions in Alberta, ending the port strike in neighboring BC, and growing the Alberta economy. Wildfires burning in BC are causing anxiety for the province's wine industry. Smoke settling onto grapes can ruin a crop with few ways to salvage it. And as Kurt Petrovich tells us, if it is tainted by smoke, the label won't tell you. A winemaker's pride pours into your glass, but more frequent wildfires may be adding a flavor that's unwanted. If your vineyard is in a valley and you've got forest fires that burn for days, that's when you're gonna get the problem. The problem is smoke taint, and they don't know how to handle it. Smoke molecules can pass through a grape's skin, binding chemically to the fruit's sugar, leaving a wine tasting bitter and ashy. It's about mitigation and, you know, not panicking and just kind of dealing with it and deal with it as it comes. Paul would know his Okanagan vineyards were threatened by wildfire smoke in 2021, forcing him to use more gentle pressing, special filtering and blending. At Blue Mountain, the smoke in 2021 was so bad they gave up on 120,000 liters, the entire vintage, and sold it to another company after filtering it. This wine writer says consumers are unlikely to ever learn what vintners do to remove smoke from wine just by reading the label. It just is, is totally unlikely that, uh, that a winery would, uh, would put something on the label which would uh, discourage consumers not to buy it. The BC Liquor Distribution Branch, which regulates wine quality in the province, won't say how much of a problem smoke taint is. In an email, the Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General told CBC News that generally, BC wine products have undergone a professional review for quality and flavor by a certified master of wines trained to detect issues with products. And if a customer is concerned about a potential quality issue, they can return it to the store to request a refund. But the off flavor can re-emerge in filtered wine years after it was bottled. So holding on to a bottle from a bad fire year like 2021 can be a gamble. My suggestion to people is in the 21 vintage, why take a chance? Drink those wines when they're young and you can't taste it because you never know. Kurt Petrovich, CBC News, Vancouver. Toronto is once again struggling with violence on public transit. Thursday stabbing caused chaos on the subway and police are still searching for the suspects. He's stabbing up. It's a tense time for transit and many are calling for change. What's that like for you to go visit somebody in the hospital who's your staff because they're doing their job? It breaks your heart, is what it does. Next, Ioana Romiliotis takes a look at the victims, the violence, and the new push to protect the public. Plus, Hollywood is banking on a blockbuster summer. <laughs> Jesus. With lots of new ways to entice moviegoers back into theaters, from high-tech seats to new snacks. But will the box office bounce back? The National takes you deeper into the stories shaping your world. Next. Toronto police have identified the suspect in yesterday's violent attack on a subway train. As we told you earlier, a passenger was stabbed several times and ended up in hospital with life-threatening injuries. Tonight, his condition is stable. Scary incidents on the country's biggest transit system have been making headlines for months. Ioana Romiliotis went to find out why, and she ended up witnessing firsthand why so many riders are on edge. 
Osama. Osama. He sees something. I just heard males okay. tonight. It happens so quickly, we're taken by surprise. Before we know it, we're in the middle of the story we're trying to cover. What are you doing with your phone? Police are responding to reports of a man with a knife. That orange weapon, a non-lethal rifle. Can't get back on the train. Repair the train. These are tense times, and this ends with no real ending. The man they're after has disappeared. What you just saw just happened a few minutes ago. Being on guard all the time has become the new normal. From swarmings to stabbings, violent incidents on Toronto's transit system have become alarmingly common. They're all disturbing, yet different enough that there's no easy explanation. It does point to a bigger social crisis, though, that keeps landing right here on this very public doorstep. There are 80 additional police officers now patrolling the Toronto Transit Commission, or TTC. It's just one part of the response to today's distress call and to many more. Just moments before the knife incident, we spoke with Deputy Chief Lauren Pogue from Toronto Police Service. I'm Yolanda, nice to meet you. As officers kept an eye out around us, she says police are dispatched to where they're needed most. It might be strategic, but it's still 80 officers and a huge transit system. It can't, you can't possibly be everywhere. No, we can't. And our um, deployments are uh, intelligence-led, you know, so we're looking at the, the frequency, the location, uh, the time of day that they're occurring to ensure that the resources that we do have here are deployed in an, an effective, efficient manner. You know, public safety is our, is our utmost priority. We want to ensure that they can use transit and uh, feel safe and be safe. People don't feel safe, though, and that's the randomness is a big part of that. So how do you address that? Well, you know, uh, uh, certainly our deployment is only one part of uh, a much larger discussion with our city partners, with TTC, on how we can, you know, together uh, ensure, again, the safety of the people riding transit and for the workers as well who are uh, here every day. Since your attack, have you been back? I haven't been on the subway. Julia Rady's sense of safety is still shaken. She was on the subway on her way to work last December when she felt something hit her shoulder. It was an empty whiskey bottle. About a minute later, the person picked up the bottle and whacked me on the forehead. And that is when my fellow passengers sort of jumped to and came to my help. I was really lucky. There was an off-duty officer on that car, so the assailant was subdued. The aftershock was posted on social media. The woman who attacked her was arrested. It's over, but it's not. Rady keeps thinking about the bigger cry for help out there. It could happen to any of my fellow citizens, and I wouldn't wish my experience on anybody else. There are people who have unfortunately lost their lives as a result of violent attacks, and the fact that it is a sign of such discontent in our city and in our system, and it's a city that I love, that hurts. That discontent, the social inequalities driving it, runs deep. Shelters are turning away nearly 200 people every night. Mental health and addictions services are buckling. And teenagers behind some of the transit attacks signal a need for more youth services too. As if that wasn't enough, inflation is taking a crushing toll on anyone who's just trying to get by. Hi. We asked Jerry Flores for his take. Nice to meet you. I'm Joanna. I'm Jerry. Flores is a sociologist with the University of Toronto. It was just up the street, right? His office is just steps away from where a woman on a streetcar was recently stabbed multiple times in the head by a stranger. So when you think about what happened to that woman just up here, what does that tell you? Yeah, so to me it represents a tale of two cities. Because TTC and any warm location is going to become a de facto place for people to come to rest. And, and he says as more people stumble back to their pre-COVID lives, paths keep colliding. Absolutely. And you hop on TTC and you may bump up against someone who is also feeling run down and tired. Maybe someone who's dealing with housing insecurity or substance abuse or mental health issues. I think that when we're all in close proximity, we're all tired, perhaps all of our basic needs aren't met. I think that that's a perfect storm for violent events to happen. These violent events can be sparked off by, by anything sometimes. Uh, a funny look, an uh, inadvertent bump, a uh, snarky comment. You just never know. And these events are more, even more likely to happen if someone has been consuming drugs or alcohol. Help keep the TTC safe. 
The immediate response is evolving by the day. Report any suspicious activity. There are the usual security cameras and safety apps, but also more visible transit staff, and the city promises to fund more special constables and outreach workers too. Hi, Mr. Leary. Nice to meet Rick Leary runs the TTC. Nice He's been in crisis mode for weeks. It's just been a little hectic. Leary says he feels the weight of responsibility to the public and his staff, How are you? who've also been victims of random attacks. What's that like for you to go visit somebody in the hospital who's your staff because they're doing their job? It breaks your heart is what it does. You know, you see how hard these employees work day in and day out. And when someone gets assaulted, you know, it... It, uh, you know, you get a lump in your throat is what happens, right, because they're good people. It must be hard to wake up and see yet another incident. And I just wonder what kind of toll that's taking on you and your staff when you're, when you're facing this and it feels so relentless. Well, you know, our staff are like our customers. They had concerns. Those high-profile incidents, they were worrisome, and we don't deny that. And, but, again, that's why we did what we did bringing everybody to the table, asking for help, bringing in specialists. Police are the most visible part of that help, but this isn't a long-term solution. Okay. Where are you going now? Uh, Officers have referred dozens of people to community services in the last few weeks. All right, have a good day, sir. But it comes back to what is waiting on the other side, other than the cold. So we didn't just arrive here in this moment, right? It's been a long, long, slow build. So Lana Fredo runs Sound Times. The group helps people who've had brushes with the law and have mental health or addiction issues. Most have nowhere to live. And she says many die waiting for subsidized housing or any kind of help. I mean, these are people that slip away quietly. Yeah. I don't think anyone really understands what a, what a terrible state of affairs we're in. In your opinion, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? We're, we're, we're reaping years and years of, of uh, inaction. Uh, in terms of all the social problems that we know that are out there, what's going on? I mean, eventually, uh, the, people can only take so much, right? Yes, and the default is, well, we need more mental health services. We'll refer them to mental health. First of all, over here at mental health, uh, the cupboard's bare. Like, the, there's nothing on offer anymore. The core issues, poverty, unaffordable housing, inadequate disability supports, the list goes on. There are no easy or quick fixes, and these desperate times keep making their way here. Joanna Romiliotis mentioned those 80 extra police officers patrolling the transit system. Well, they're not there anymore. The overtime cost was too high. Now regular on-duty officers decide when to check for possible trouble. The Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is set to reopen next year. Coming up, how a Montreal man is helping to raise the new roof. Plus. This is a big screen movie going experience. I mean, I hope most people see it on the big screen. What the movie industry is doing to get you back into theaters. That's next. pandemic, it's been a bumpy ride for the movie industry. And this summer, there's hope big blockbusters will boost box office returns. Earlier this year, Eli Glasner took a closer look at how Hollywood is planning to stage a comeback. <laughs> Jesus. Welcome to CinemaCon, where the movie chains and studios gather to focus on the movie theater experience. Wonderful. Thank you. Want your movie seats to go to the next level? This is the place for 3D glasses for extra effects. Ouch! <laughs> Water! It sprayed me! Down another floor, Snackland. What would the movies be without popcorn and... You've engineered hot dogs to take them to the next level? Oreo-flavored churros, anyone? Oh my god. 
It's appropriate the convention takes place here at Caesars Palace in the heart of Las Vegas because for the past few years, releasing movies into theaters felt like a bit of a gamble. Movie chains went bankrupt. We were home and streaming. But now, the hope here is that the studios are ready to double down on the theatrical experience. This is a celebration, a genuine celebration. If ever movie theaters were going to disappear, and we've heard for years they will, it was when every theater was closed, a chain went into bankruptcy, we got out of the habit of going to the movies, and even our grandparents learned how to stream. Behind the flashy posters and displays are a parade of promises from studio chiefs recommitting to making movies for movie theaters. It's a symbiotic relationship. Take The Flash, one of the summer's most anticipated titles. When you watch Batman zooming on a new bat cycle, Oscar-winning production designer Paul Osterberry made that. This piece here moves, these shields flip up. Details, he says, best appreciated in a theater. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're designing these things and we're designing the film for the big screen. I mean, it, this is a big screen movie going experience. I mean, I hope most people see it on the big screen. If we didn't have that movie marketplace and those ticket sales, would you even be able to contemplate something like this? No, I don't, I don't think so. This, this kind of movie is made for the multiplex. It's made for the big spectacle. You've never faced anything like this. And in 2023, spectacle is what the studios are serving. I just got out of the Warner Brothers presentation at Cinema Con. Millions follow Julian Green on TikTok for his movie picks. He's still buzzing over a sneak peek of Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. It wasn't finished quite yet, but you could just feel the vibe of that movie. The music was incredible. And Wonka, a prequel about the man who becomes the famous candy maker. I love Willy Wonka. I loved you Wilder in that role, and I love Timothy Chalamet. And I like the story of Willy Wonka before he got cynical. Punch it! But while the calendar is bursting with sequels and big brand names, audiences haven't flocked back to smaller films like She Said, Tar, or even Ticket to Paradise. Once popular genres, comedy and love stories are in danger of fading from the big screen. We want to be able to walk into a movie complex, and most of them are complexes, not single theaters, and see a real variety of movies. Or families can go in and even split up in the lobby. What's here to stay is streaming. While Apple and Amazon are committing to spending billions on releasing films into theaters this year, the CEO of Netflix said bluntly, driving folks to a theater is just not our business. At CinemaCon, let's say they're taking that in stride. Fine, stay on TV where no one's watching what you're watching and, and let's, let's champion what Apple and Amazon and, and the studios are doing. While more needs to be done to carve out places for small stories on the big screen, at a time when many feel divided, movies offer something special. They're so rare of things that we can do as humans where we all come together and we experience the same emotion in the room, right? We're crying or we're afraid, we're terrified in a quiet place. Communal experience making a comeback. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Las Vegas. Brooklyn Heights is undeniably Canada's most famous drag queen, known for her performances in RuPaul's Drag Race. But offstage, Heights is Brock Hayhoe. And in an interview with Ian, Hayhoe talked about protests over drag queen story hours. For somebody outside a library, whether it's in Canada or the United States, holding a sign, enraged that someone dressed like you or Brooklyn Heights is in that library reading their children. If you could walk out of the library and say something to those people, what would you say? What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Like, what, like what, is, what is the fear here? And why are you not okay with this, but you're okay with taking your child to Hooters? Why are you not okay with this, but allowing your children to play with guns? Like, what is the fear? I think, it, I think that's what it all boils down to, the fear of not understanding, the fear of something different than you. There's so much more to that conversation, including what it was like for him to grow up in a conservative Christian household in Toronto and more on his journey to fame. You can catch the interview Sunday right here on The National.
The world's most powerful AI robots have a message for humans. Coming up, what they had to say about stealing your job. Plus, I think I was like, oh my God, like did someone just uncover something we've never seen before? So what exactly is this mystery critter? That's coming up in our moment. I don't believe in limitations, only opportunities. Let's explore the possibilities of the universe and make this world our playground. That was Desdemona, a humanoid robot responding to a question about whether there should be regulations on artificial intelligence. It was one of nine creations taking part in the world's first robot press conference at a United Nations summit. Now, while this particular answer was slightly defiant, other robots said they support regulations, don't intend to steal jobs held by humans, and don't have plans to turn on their creators. Now that's cutting edge technology, but there still is an important place in this world for certain skills that are centuries old. A blacksmith in Montreal is lending his expertise to help restore the famous Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Chloe Rinaldi shows us how he put some muscle into it. For 23 years, Mathieu Collette has run the Montreal Forges. I find a certain spirituality doing this. Um, so for me, it, it's not a job. Um, I'm using a science to uh, uh, make myself an happy human. He's one of the few people in the world with expertise in pre-industrial blacksmith techniques and modern techniques that use electricity. He specializes in making tools using the best practices of both models. In 2019, a fire destroyed the roof and spire of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Last October, the Forgerons de France reached out to Colette to create 12th century axes for the roof. Two years ago, they decided to uh, rebuild the uh, cathedral as possible with the uh, old ways. By studying the remaining wood and the markings on it, they were able to deduce the different kinds of axes that could have been used at that time and made axes nearly identical. So the new wood beams would have similar markings to the original. We uh, have made the, the, the axes the same ways by using techniques, material and tools of the time. But of course we have electricities. So instead of have a, a, a leather bellow, we have an electrical blower. He and other blacksmiths made about 60 axes. Each took between 9 to 14 hours to make and will be used by carpenters to build the trusses of the church. Meanwhile, Colette is hoping more people take up the craft. I create Les Forges de Montréal. It's a place where people could learn that science and be in contact with something that was important in our history and could help the next generation. For centuries to come, people will be able to see his work at the French landmark. Chloe Rinaldi, CBC News, Montreal. All right, so here's the question. What the heck is this? It's not a squirrel and it's not a mole. It is a new species. Is it a new species altogether? The hairless mystery critter was recently spotted near Saskatoon and even the experts had never seen anything quite like it. So tonight, this rodent riddle is our moment. What the heck is this? So we're getting the three-year-old ready. He was playing outside and he came across, as he called it, kittens. <laughs> and they turned out not to be kittens. Don't move. I didn't know what they were, so I thought I'd record it. And then he tried to feed it a Timbit, which they didn't like. <laughs> I did say in the video it's quite ugly. God, it's ugly. It, it's, it's like that cute ugly. <laughs> but when I got home that night to Google everything, nothing came up at all. I didn't know what they were, and then I ended up posting it on Facebook going, what is this? <laughs> 174 comments later, still no one knew. <laughs> some of them were like moles, some were rats. I think I was like, oh my God, like did someone just uncover something we've never seen before? So I contacted a couple people and both people said, wow, yeah, that's really bizarre. I've never heard of that before. So the consensus among the experts in this field is that it's a hairless Richardson's ground squirrel my three-year-old. He enjoys the, the hairless cats, he calls them. <laughs>
I totally get how a, a toddler could see that as a hairless cat, but I am voting on rat. That's probably what I would have thought at first glance. That's The National for Friday, June 7th. Have a good night.